Ethan. I'm Erin Dealey, uh, quite the prestigious scientist. Who we have before us today, if you haven't already visited the Biosphere 2 or know of him, um, I would love, and I, I want to thank you, Yost, for being the first to um, speak for our new virtual Science Cafe series. It was our attempt to make the most of um, losing, you know, four venues of science talks in March, April, and, and at least one in May. So thank you so much for being willing. And this is the first of three. So we'll have three consecutive weeks where we'll have speakers from that original spring series at different venues um, come up and, and offer their talks. Um, and you can find that, of course, you'll see at the last slide, we have a uh, link, you know, link to the um, College of Science, Science Cafe webpage, um, and our talks that are coming up in the next two weeks. But um, real quick, I'm just going to let you know that Dr. Van Heren is broadly trained earth scientist and has researched topics from 40 kilometers deep in the earth's crust to soil plant atmosphere interactions. He earned his master's degree at Yale Vern University and um, he's a proud alum, PhD at the University of Arizona and obviously he's faculty and in, he came to Arizona in 1995 to run the analytical facilities at Biosphere 2. Um, and for his PhD, he investigated the influence of plant species on the production of greenhouse gases um, by soil bacteria in highly diverse tropical forests of Brazil. And currently he's an assistant research professor at the U of A Biosphere 2, and he investigates carbon uptake by weathering the basalt in the Landscape Evolutionary Observatory, or the LEO project, and drought effects on carbon and water cycling rates in the tropical rainforest. Um, he also is one of our faculty in the Honors College, and he, he's one of the interdisciplinary faculty members. And I always ask our speakers if they'd be willing to share some personal notes about themselves, because we all know scientists are people too. Um, so Yo shared with us that he's the proud father of two high school age daughters, um, one of whom will start at the U of A next year, this fall, so, or next year at the U of A. So we're excited to have her join the Wildcat family. And together with his family, he really enjoys camping and hiking around Southern Arizona. Um, and when at home, he enjoys puttering around his backyard herb, vegetable, and fruit garden, and watching a variety of shows like all of us, you know, on streaming services right now. So um, I want to thank Yost again. And thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be mainly talking about how we use Biosphere 2 to look at ecosystem responses to environmental changes. And there's actually uh, three levels of changes I want to talk about, um, mainly at first. Uh, I'll talk about how, um, especially in Biosphere 2, because of the small amount of air relative to the amount of vegetation in the plants, um, Biosphere 2 form really is like a magnifying glass on how these plants produce um, gases, especially volatile organic compounds. And so gases that are normally very difficult to measure in the real world we can measure them much more easily in Biosphere 2. Then we'll talk about uh, photosynthesis and ecosystem responses to photosynthesis and how we can use Biosphere 2 to look at what scientists right now are using to inform their models for the large scale ecosystem models and land use, uh, land uh, community models that they're using to predict what kind of changes there we're gonna see in the next 100 to 200 years. What can we learn from Biosphere 2 about the, the, how we use those models? And then thirdly, we'll talk about how we can use uh, isotopes, which are like a dye, uh, in particularly well in Biosphere 2, to trace, for instance, how carbon and water will move through the ecosystem. And I'll focus on water. So, let me back up. So, uh, and actually, by the way, here, if anybody has never been to Biosphere 2, the bottom here are three images. Uh, on the right, it's uh, out of 1991, so early on, uh, right after Biosphere 2 was built. And then in the middle is in 2012. And then um, the picture on the left is very recently. And one of the key things you can see, uh, all three have this concrete structure in there. Uh, that's the mountain, and behind it you see in the right, it's all glass, and in the left you can see that the trees have grown up all the way to the top. 
So the ecosystem has matured quite well over time. So uh, why do we look at tropical forest ecosystems? What is so important about them? Why do we want to know what's going on? And, and, and I'm going to move my bar here for a second out of the way. So tropical forests actually, they represent about 25% of all carbon on the planet. And they cycle more carbon than any other uh, biome on the planet. And one of the examples of that is here on the top right. Uh, the, this is an intercomparison of a whole group of carbon cycling models uh, measuring the annual land flux in carbon in pentagrams. Penta stands for 10 to the 15th, so this is a lot of grams of carbon. And uh, the negative numbers here are uh, carbon dioxide going back into the atmosphere and the positive numbers are carbon dioxide going into the land, so into the ecosystem, into the trees, maybe for photosynthesis. And what you can see here from this, and what I want to take you away, you to take away from is like, so it wasn't doing well, these models are all uh, doing well up to about 1990s, and then suddenly it starts to really diverge with some models being uh, showing that there's going to be a lot more uptake, which are probably dominated by the way that they're actually writing in their code how photosynthesis is going to increase with more carbon dioxide. And then you have these models here that actually are showing that um, there is a large amount of carbon dioxide coming out of the ecosystems. And that is mainly dominated by deforestation in the tropics and as well the conversion of the tropics to the savanna, mainly due to drought. So that shows you why, how important it is to know the tropics because this gap here is mainly caused just by the Amazon basin. And so that's an enormous amount of carbon and influence. The other thing is that uh, here I wanted to show in the bottom right, this is the temperature change since 1900. And so then on the x-axis you can see time. And this is mainly for the Amazon basin. And so the temperature increase hasn't been that much yet, about half to one degree. Uh, but over the next uh, 100 years, it's likely going to be another uh, two to five degrees centigrade, which is about, uh, about 3.6 to about uh, 10 uh, degrees Fahrenheit or just under 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a strong amount of warming that's going to happen. And there is no analog right now to those warmer forests. Uh, because all the lowland tropical forests are already at what people expect to be a temperature maximum. And so BiosV2 as a greenhouse actually provides us with an analog here as well to actually look at this greater land warming. Lastly, I want to mention is that the key thing as well, besides the amount of carbon that they store, tropical forests are important for another couple of reasons. One is with the land use change, if we actually cut down the forest, they, they release a lot of carbon, which is super important. And then the other thing is there is, uh, there are together with coral reef ecosystems, the most diverse ecosystems on the planet. And for instance, we get a lot of medicine like the quinine against malaria, cancer, anti-cancer drugs, anti-hypertension um, drugs out of tropical forest plants. So that's another reason why we want to really care about tropical forests and what's going to happen with, to them with climate change. So the human impact and then mainly on drought. So with deforestation is one, the drought also is a, an effect of climate change. We know in the Amazon basin, for instance, that increased climate change has led to a lot more drought. But the key thing is that one third of all rainfall in tropical forests, and especially in the Amazon basin, comes from the trees themselves. It's actually recycled water. And so if we start cutting down trees or we lose trees through drought mortality, they die, then those trees are lost to actually transpire for other trees. And so with cutting down on the forest, the rain might still fall, but it actually will run off. It will not be able to be re-emitted back into the atmosphere. So that's actually a key effect where deforestation and climate change go hand in hand. So it's deforestation is a cause of climate change, but it actually goes hand in hand as well to exacerbate these kind of issues within uh, the Amazon basin. 
So what is DOM to DOM to understand drought and drought responses in tropical forests? And one is uh, satellite uh, measurements. So these are the, the satellites that cycle over that actually measure uh, productivity, and they can also measure rainfall. And then that's combined with tower observation. I'll show you a, a tower picture in the next slide. And then, uh, because I wanted to actually to show these drought experiments that are much less common, there's two of them in the Amazon basin that have been going since, one uh, is still going since about 2000, the other one only ran for about four years. And they cover a part of the landscape uh, with these panels to divert off the rainfall. Problem there is that the trees themselves actually, the, yes, the soil dries out because it doesn't get the water, but actually the canopy of the tree still sees the high humidity. Uh, so it's actually only a partial drought. What they found in their experiments was that the trees were quite resilient, up to three to four years, absolutely strong reduction in rainfall they could handle. But again, that's because, part because the canopy still saw the water. So another option is actually using an experimental rainforest, like an artificial forest like we have in Biosphere 2, where we simply can make a drought happen by turning off the tap whenever we want it. And then we actually also have the whole atmosphere sensing that drought as well. So Biosphere 2, is, in that regard, we see it as a unique model ecosystem that combines the, the, the complexity of a forest. We have, and I'll show you in a later slide, about uh, 25 different tree species. We have about 90 different species at all overall uh, that are all growing together for, have been for the past 30 years. And it's, so it's a complex ecosystem that has matured over time. And again, we have a small atmosphere to biosphere ratio. Uh, we actually have quite deep soil up to four meters, uh, more or less on average about two and a half to three meters. And we have these control capabilities. And again, this in the right here, this graph shows sort of where Biosphere 2 lies. Uh, it's on this X scale here is the spatial scale. So a very large continental scale is with these towers. Uh, and this tower is, for instance, one of them that I was gonna mention. Um, that tower is actually 180 feet plus tall. So it's very tall that, uh, and it actually measures the, the instability of the air of, over the, the rainforest canopy to then actually infer what is the amount of water and carbon exchange that's happening together with the energy exchange. Another picture here of uh, one of those uh, drought experiments and then a small, slightly smaller scale is Biosphere 2 but it's a larger scale than growth chambers and mesocosms that also have more control over the, uh, the system. The key thing is that the Biosphere 2 in a way is a bridge between what we observe at these large scale experiments uh, in the bottom right uh, and just overall observations versus the small scale uh, measurements that we make in growth chambers. One key thing because Biosphere 2 is this glass dome it actually is, again, the hottest planet on the rainforest, uh, uh, the rainforest on the planet. And so therefore it actually sees temperatures that are well 10 to 15 degrees higher than any forest normally sees. So with that, indeed, we got this window into the future. Just to give you a quick, and I'm not gonna dwell on this, this is just the different sensors that we have. So we have environmental sensors above ground along these profiles, different heights. And then we also have these below ground profiles. Uh, we normally right now run it as a flow through system. Uh, so we have air coming in from the outside and flowing out to the top. And it's part for the cooling, but it's also part for mixing this air and making sure that we can control conditions. We don't have carbon dioxide concentrations going too high. And then we also have uh, capabilities to actually inject carbon dioxide through uh, using a CO2 sensor and then a tank of CO2. And along these sensors, uh, the towers, we have temperature, relative humidity, light, wind, and then below ground, mainly temperature, and then moisture content sensors. Uh, this is just an overview of the map. Uh, north is here to the right, and uh, this is the, are the, the different tree species, and I'm not going to dwell on this, mainly showing that actually this is the bottom part here, uh, separated by this black line. That's actually sort of a separate basin from the western part, 
And so uh, in a way we can, for instance, do mass balance in these separate basins and focus on certain trees uh, more than others if we want to, especially for the below ground and water cycling aspects. Alrighty, so the key research projects that I will show today uh, from both Columbia University and the University of Arizona. So this actually spans uh, 20 years of research. Uh, the isoprene emissions and terpenoid emissions, uh, elevated carbon dioxide uh, experiments, temperature experiments, and then mainly drought experiments. All right, so I'll start with the, the uh, volatile organic carbon compounds. And so this here is a diagram that uh, is actually put out by the um, next generation ecosystem exchange experiments for the tropics. Uh, this is a large group funded by the Department of Energy and they use this as their diagram. So mainly the volatile uh, carbon compound emissions or green leaf volatile emissions, they come from the tops of the trees, from the leaves. Uh, it also shows the other components. It's all mainly driven by light, so that's the key thing. And uh, isoprene is one of the, uh, the simplest terp terpenoids. It's sort of the building block for all of these other ones, uh, but sort of give you a sense of what these are. Um, uh, eucalyptus, camphor, methanol, uh, of, uh, sorry, I mispronounced it, menthol. Uh, those are all forms of it. And so they, those are the more common ones that we know, and especially if you know vape, vape, vapor rub, then you know uh, what I'm talking about. And other flavor compounds that these are coming in are cinnamon, cloves, and ginger. And so but at Biosphere 2, actually this gas, isoprene, it's actually builds up so much that you can, you can smell it. And you never, never normally can smell it. Uh, actually, isoprene itself has like a metallic smell. And so the reason you can smell it in Biosphere 2 is here and is shown in this graph. It's uh, the isoprene concentration in parts per billion. And then you have several days here of data and then uh, the time of hours of the day, 0, 12, 0, 12, each time is a different day. You can see and so that you can see that during the daytime it builds up very strongly and then it goes down again. This bottom dashed line here that's the Amazon daily variation. So in Biosphere 2, we see concentrations 30 to 50 times higher than in the real world. So that's right there, that magnifying glass. Right? If we can, we can measure, make these measurements so much easier in a Biosphere 2 than you would have to, or could into the real world, you would have a, need a lot more precise instrumentation in the real world to pick up the variability. And then for, based on these kind of diurnal changes, we can measure what is the total flux. A couple of key outcomes from the work. And again, I'm not gonna show too much of this data because otherwise I will, we would hear for, I'd be here for hours. But uh, so isoprene actually has a soil sink until uh, we started measuring that at Biosphere 2. Very few people had thought about that the soils would actually be in a sink. And normally you don't see that because the concentrations don't build up enough but there are actually microbes in the soil that you know, consume it. And actually as a drought goes on, that soil sink is actually being reduced because the microbes become less active. Now for the emission side, uh, we see, have, have seen very little changes with drought. Uh, with drought, and we'll see later, it actually, the, uh, the photosynthesis reduces quite strongly. Uh, but the isoprene emissions, they remain constant. And that's a key thing. It shows you that the, the plants are changing their way that they're using their carbon. They are not putting it into their structure as much anymore, but they're actually using it to offset, uh, to offset stress because isoprene alleviates temperature stress. So if things get hot, isoprene em emissions helps help the plants to cool their leaves as well as uh, other things including stress relief. Uh, and so the other thing is that the temperature maximum of isoprene emissions is actually greater than photosynthesis. So even if the photosynthesis goes down because the temperature is too high, uh, isoprene emissions keep continuing on. And as I'll show you next is that actually the, with the temperature, these trees can do much more photosynthesis than, uh, than actually what was expected. So with that, the isoprene emissions 
will take away from carbon being stored in the system, which we want to for us humans to help us with the increasing carbon concentration. All right, let's go to the photosynthesis. So um, here again, it's a, that same graph that I showed you earlier. And uh, now the green leaf volatiles are gone. It's just focusing on photosynthesis and water movement. Again, light is the main driving factor. Uh, the carbon is taking up through photosynthesis, carbon dioxide together with water and energy are formed into sugars. And then those sugars can be used for anything like uh, the volatile organic carbon compounds production or autotrophic respiration. So the respiration by the plant material itself or even also with uh, stimulating microbes in, in the soil. But I'll focus just on the photosynthesis right now. And in the top left here, uh, there are four uh, model responses of uh, or environmental drivers. And these are the model responses that people are right now using in the large uh, ecosystem and community land models that people use to make predictions. So for light, it, quick in, increase with light, uh, similar for bio, carbon dioxide, and there's a maximum with temperature, and it decreases with increasing BPD. And BPD is uh, the vapor pressure deficit, which actually is how much more water the air can hold uh, to get to saturation, right? So if you don't have 100% humidity in the air, then actually the air can take up more water. And so that will actually then suck that out of the plants because in the leaves themselves, they have 100% uh, water content. So let me continue on. So what does it look like? So here are some of the experiments that we did during Columbia University, looking at light and carbon dioxide response. And just, I'll start out here in the bottom right. So these are uh, the experimental conditions and changes we did for the CO2 manipulation. So you can see in the top here, we actually stepped sequentially up and down through 400, 700, 1,000 and 1,200 parts per million. So this is well into the future, right? Right now we're just over 400, about 415 parts per million for, uh, on Earth. And this is likely to go increase. Whether we ever hit 1,200, I don't know. Uh, geologically, uh, the Earth has been well over 1,200, but that's hundreds uh, of I think it's about 65, uh, 70 million years ago, so uh, a long time ago. And uh, then we also did this uh, variation randomly uh, to see whether this up and down actually had any effect and it that didn't make any difference. So what did we take from that? So if we take the, the left graphs here, in the top are the leaf level uh, measurements. So we actually measured uh, from these uh, six different species we measured the photosynthesis rate. And you can see that with light on the left here and carbon dioxide concentration here on the right, they both are increasing uh, rapidly uh, and then plateauing off. If you look at the whole ecosystem, oh, my apologies. Uh, if you look at the whole ecosystem level here on the bottom, then it looks for the light, it actually increases quickly, but it doesn't really level off as much as uh, we would expect. Uh, for carbon dioxide, it seems to behave very similar to what the leaves did. So with that, if we look again at these responses, then pretty much what the Biosphere 2 experiments, what they did is confirm the way that uh, the models have the parameterization. So it seems like these models are doing well uh, for carbon dioxide and light. So now if we look at temperature, uh, if you look here at the bottom left, uh, top left, sorry, uh, we actually have the scaled ecosystem carbon uptake. So we scaled it mainly because all these forests have their own total amount of carbon that they're exchanging. And so we just took what the maximum is and then scaled every other measurement down from that uh, or normalized it by it. And uh, the Amazon basin here is in blue. So the, this is the average of three different sites in the Amazon basin. And then uh, Tezopaco is actually in northern Mexico, a uh, dry deciduous forest. And so you can see therefore there's a very strong decrease with temperature in the amount of photosynthesis or the carbon uptake done by the ecosystem. 
And you can see that biosphere two, both during non-drought, the orange and drought conditions, is actually almost flatlined. It doesn't seem to be affected by it, even though the temperatures go up well above where the Amazon basin ever goes and well above the about 27 degrees centigrade uh, and 28 degrees centigrade when both these other natural forests are actually starting to decrease, it looks like biosphere two is not affected. Now, if you look here at the right, these are uh, measurements of critical temperature. This is the temperature where actually the proteins for photosynthesis start to break down. And what you can see here is that number one, in the canopy species there, those temperatures are higher than for understory species. Those are the ones that are in shade that they not, are not expecting very high, experiencing very high temperatures normally. And then the other thing is that between black and white, it's winter to versus summer, that actually these trees are, in the leaves in the trees are actually adapting or acclimating to the changes uh, within the seasons. So these are very rapid changes to increasing and changing temperature of these trees. So that to me suggests that this whole notion that tropical forests are, going, are already running at an, in, or for instance in the Amazon basin, are already at the temperature maximum is not quite correct, uh, at least in based on biosphere two. These three species inside biosphere two can handle a much higher temperature and adjust rapidly to it. Now, what is then driving that change that we see in, in the real world? And why is it not changing the biosphere too? Well, it turns out if we then look at the vapor pressure deficit and plot the same data versus the vapor pressure deficit, we actually see that they all fall pretty much on the same trend. So that suggests that actually vapor pressure deficit, which actually very strongly goes in hand, in hand with the temperature. Uh, so they're, very, they're co-variates in a way. Uh, seems to be the more dominant driver than temperature actually. And so with that, if you look at the model responses again, temperature doesn't seem to be uh, well represented in the models. Uh, vapor pressure deficit, I wouldn't make it necessarily a curve like this, but overall the trend is, is, is similar. But it seems that with temperature, we definitely have an, an issue. So uh, in 2010, we published this paper uh, where we actually looked at that temperature parameterization, that's the top right here, where we looked at stress, no stress is one, full stress is zero, and then different temperatures. The black is what normally was used for the Amazon basin in this model, and so we made a new parameterization for biosphere two, where the temperature, uh, the photosynthesis was kept going until about 45 degrees centigrade, and we let it drop off really quickly. And here on the left or center, you can see uh, the results of that. The black circles each time are uh, the real data. And then the blue lines are actually the Amazon basin model. So you can see it always overestimates here. It doesn't really fit well. But then with this new calibration factor, it actually, and, and keeping that temperature going, uh, the photosynthesis going to higher temperatures actually makes it work and, and makes it better fit. So it suggests that actually the, the canopy can acclimate to higher temperatures uh, than Amazon forests suggest, and that these models potentially need to be adjusted. So with the photosynthesis, it showed that, that uh, carbon dioxide and light, yeah, totally fine. VPD uh, might have slight changes, but it's really the temperature that seems to be off. So now we'll just go to, to water and we'll not necessarily go through the whole white water cycle here, which is right here, these two gray and blue lines, uh, the evaporation from the soil, which in the large forest in general is a much minor, more minor component than the transpiration. So the water, uh, the pooling is mainly uh, by the air, pulling the water out of the leaves and that pulls the water up all the way from down from the roots through the stems. And so, key thing is that uh, it seems that in general trees are deeper rooted and uh, for instance in these drought experiments uh, that I showed you earlier with the panels there were uh, roots people found roots down even uh, 12 meters or about 36 feet down deep in the soil so even tropical forests have very deep roots and so how does that, do they use that? What is, where do they get the water from? How does that change the cycling? So that's one of the things that we wanted to look at 
And again, like I said before, we're going to mainly focus on the tree species here in this eastern part uh, where the soil is deeper, anywhere between about uh, just under two meters all the way up to about four meters. And so what we did in these experiments is that initially with the rainfall, we added this uh, D2O or deuterium uh, water. So we added a spike of deuterium uh, to the rainwater uh, to then see use mass spectrometers. And um, uh, this year we actually used uh, isotope lasers to trace that water going through the system. And so if you look at that, here is a graph. This graph shows the day since the re-wetting separately for the rainfall, the seepage, which is the water that flows from down the bottom of the soil out, it normally would go into a river. Uh, it's analog the soil and the xylem. And then this is the isotope uh, ratio, which actually is always uh, expressed in per mil, but it's, it's mainly a ratio of how much of the heavy isotopes, the deuterium relative to the hydrogen. And what you can see here is that uh, with this peak, so it started out, and this is just after the peak to look at uh, how it, it changed before, but before it was similar to this. This is the normal val value for deuterium from the um, uh, well that we have at Biosphere 2, so we're always getting a very constant value in. And you can see here with the rainfall, we had about a 200 per mil change. And that 200 per mil change, and it was also short, it was only for the days that we rained. If we then looked at the seepage, the rain or the water that's coming out of the bottom that normally would flow into the river, that also had a very quick response. And then there was a little bit of a lingering for a couple of days, uh, up to a week, and then pretty much back to normal. In the soil, especially in the top of the soil, it actually uh, remained. And the reason why this value is lower is because the water was mixing in with the water in the soil itself and therefore uh, creating lower values. Again, that water would have been this minus 60. And, uh, but the bottom of the soil very, saw very little of it. And that's mainly because right there, down in the bottom of the soil, it's actually flowing through the system and, and not being resident. And then these are the values from the trees. And so you can see that uh, here, again, it was a much lower and it's also very variable. So I'm gonna blow this up for a second. And so you can see this more clearly. So right now we have that same little graph here blown up with scale. And so you can see that for certain trees like this uh, Hibiscus elatus and uh, Clitoria rasmosa, they actually had a quick and, and big response also did the Pterocarpus indicus, but not quite as big. But both this Eura crepitans, as well as the Ceba pandambara, never showed, oh, the Eura did, but much delayed and, and much lower, and the Ceba never did. And so it showed the response to the label. And so that suggested that, okay, there are some strange things going on with where do these trees actually get their water from? Clearly, the, the, the Clitoria rasmosa and the Hibiscus elata, they're taking up this water pretty click quickly. Uh, so they have clearly shallow roots. But does the Seabed Pentandra, for instance, only have deep roots that it never saw the label? Or, and that's what this di diagram here shows on the right, if you look at the tree, there is also this big storage compartment in the wood itself. And is this just a result of mixing with the water or does the water just not flow through fast enough? So that's one thing that we wanted to address with this experiment that we just did in uh, 2019. So this is all what I'm going to show right now. All that other was relatively old stuff, although the water study was uh, finally published in 2019, but we did the, the work in 2014 and 15. So now I'll show you something that is totally hot off the press. And this was a, an experiment that actually was initiated by Christiane Werner out of uh, the University of Freiburg. And together with Laura Meredith and Amaya Ladd, they led this experiment uh, last fall. And so really what we did during this uh, experiment, uh, we did this control period first, and then we actually started a drought in early October that ran, and then we added the deep water uh, pulse. We also, in between during the, before the drought and at the end of the drought, we did a carbon-13 CO2 pulse. But, and I'll show you just some pictures of that, but nothing more. 
no data uh, yet, we're still working on that. And the key thing is, uh, and so the key question we wanted to ask is, how does drought change plants and ecosystem carbon and water cycling? And for that, we actually uh, developed a shed in the mountain of the rainforest here on the top right. And what you're looking at there is about three and a half million dollars worth of equipment that was put in there. We put in about, uh, uh, I'll show here, so this tubing that you see, so we actually put in leaf uh, chambers in the canopy uh, at about 13 meter height and also for some of the understory species. For those, uh, we needed about four miles worth of tubing going back and forth to the shed. Uh, we monitored the gases coming off the stem, so we also monitored the flow of water going through the stem and the quantity of water in, in the tree stems, and then we monitored the amount of water in the soils through these sensors that we installed. So really uh, a lot of work to actually determine what's going on in this system. Uh, this one, one of the big moments when we released $20,000 worth of carbon dioxide in the system to actually see what's going on and, and see how we can trace it. And then all these people were working to collect samples and so forth. And then this picture here to the right, it's me with Christiana Werner, after we took one of the panels out of the, uh, the Biosphere 2 rainforest glass system. So we actually could quickly exchange that back out and it would be just a quick peak of CO2 in there. So what are some of the results? So this is for the water and bear with me, this is a massive amount of data. Uh, again, uh, on the x-axis here, it's, it's uh, time. And this is one of the trees we measured. And then we have the stem water content and the sap flux, so the amount of water that's actually moving through. And you see that there is a, uh, until the drought happens, they are both relatively high. Then you can see them decreasing during drought. And then as we deep re-wet re the, Sap flux itself wasn't really strongly responding to shed, but you see that actually some of these trees that have lost a fair amount of water out of the stems immediately started refilling that water. Other trees actually waited much longer until they started refilling. And then when we started putting rain on the system, then uh, again, uh, the sap fluxes indeed started to recover again. This here inset here just shows you what it looks like uh, on a weekly average for all these peaks. Right? So it actually shows you that uh, from during the day, nighttime, very little flow, and it's, all the flow is mainly during the midday hours. Depending on where the canopy it is, it can be earlier and later in the day. And so how does this then uh, square off with this whole idea of the tree being a storage? Well, our experiment shows that even though there is a very strong diurnal from the top here, this is the total amount of stem water we move through the system. So this is averaging, and this is on the east side of the, uh, the rainforest. This is combining all the trees and all their water being moved, uh, the changes in the stem. And so there you can see there's a definitely strong change. There's a change over the drought. But if you look here at the bottom, uh, all of them are at, at a cubic meter. So it's uh, a thousand liters uh, scale. You can see that the stem water, in, you know, the sap flow in green really matches the amount of water loss from the soil really well. But the stem water is a flat line here because of the scale is much greater. And down here on the right, it's the same deal. It stays much more constant than the sap flux and, and the, uh, the soil water does. So it suggests that, oh yes, this is a water component. Uh, it's storage to a certain extent. It actually does fluctuate very strongly with drought, but it cannot supply water for the leaves when the photosynthesis is going on. So there must be another function to this water. Here are a couple other trees, and these are the more slower trees. And so one of the key things, and I'm sorry I forgot to point out, but I'll point it out right now. The fluxes here are right now a factor of 10 lower than they were in the previous graph with all this, this time series. So these are actually flowing much less water through them than uh, the larger trees or the fast responding trees did. And you can see again, uh, different behaviors on the diurnal pattern. The other cool thing here is that we have these large canopy trees that are relatively little affected, 
but you can see these two here are understory trees and they're very strongly affected like this one by the daily rain cycle and as well then they completely dry out and it takes them a relatively long time to come uh, to respond so definitely uh, even though the understory species are okay during the drought they are strongly affected so now if we add that label what's going to happen so here you can see for the soil uh, the different depths, uh, so two uh, centimeters all the way to one meter 80. And so you can see we really added that label only to the deep soil. And so if you then look at the trees, uh, this is actually measurements from stem borehole. So this is at about 1.5 meter height and, and about three meter height, uh, the different symbols. Again, I don't want to dwell on the details here, but the key is that pretty much all the trees are responding relatively quickly to this. Uh, some much faster than others. This is, for instance, that hibiscus again. Uh, the clitoria ones are these red ones and blue ones, so they're really fast. And actually, the uh, one of the three species uh, that is slower uh, is 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 like again, it, it's responding, but it takes about a week to a week and a half longer, and the peak is 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 even further out. The understory species, as you can see these purple and red here, they don't respond whatsoever to the, the drought. So they're not seeing any of that deep label. It's really only the big trees and they don't seem to, at least not to these smaller trees, redistributing this water, what oftentimes happens and people have been showing that in ecosystems. So it's not happening here. Now, another one I wanted to show here, and this is measured at the leaf level. Uh, and this is the only one that we have analyzed so far. As you can imagine, we're still working on this data, but this is a slow responder. And you can see here is the wetting period. And pretty much after a couple of days, it starts to immediately show the, uh, the label coming out at the leaves and peaking uh, just maybe a, a half a week to a week after uh, the, the big trees. So this is actually, uh, and the clitoria and the, uh, the hibiscus, so this is actually that tree that took three to four weeks longer than when uh, the water was added to um, the rainwater. So it to me suggests that this tree uh, probably mainly has deep roots and the, the amount of relatively uh, shallow roots it has is, is not as great. The other thing is uh, that with the deep roots, it actually because the sap flow is lower, it takes a little bit li longer time for the water to go through, but all trees are deeply rooted in this forest. So with that, uh, the model parameterization, appropriate for CO2, light and vapor pressure de deficit, but temperature wise, they are actually tropical forest, most likely much more resilient than we give them for. And then with drought experiments, uh, the tree response to drought and re-wetting is highly variable from trees, although they all are deeply rooted uh, except for the underspory species. So with that, uh, I hope that I've shown you that uh, Bias V2 is a great tool to actually trace these kind of changes going through the, the ecosystem, as well as uh, looking at how climate variables are going to impact tropical forests and how Bias V2 hopefully can really help us improve the way that we actually uh, parameterize models to check how uh, 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 to actually make predictions for the future. And with that, I'm going to stop it and open up for questions. And actually, I have to put in the slide with the funding and people thanks. Thank you again, and this great talk. And of course, just as a reminder, if any of you want to refer your friends or family or networks, um, we will post this on the College of Science YouTube channel, and all that information is available on science.arizona.edu and it's under our science cafe link. So with that, um, we can conclude. Very cool. I'm glad thank we got you, it Shiloh. kicked off. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say thank you to Shiloh and uh, thank you for the introduction. Also, yo, so I hope you continue to do well through the end of the semester and our audience, thank you, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, and just as a reminder, if you want to join us for the next few talks, you will need to um, visit those links and register for each talk. So we look forward to having everyone come back and bring your friends. Thank you.